Hello, this is Jeff Swenson coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah. This lecture is a refresher course for the 2014 University of Utah Postgraduate Anesthesia Meeting. We'd like to pr provide this for you so that you can at your leisure review the comments that were made during that meeting. This slide and talk uh, is entitled Riding the Waves of Change since there are many things happening in regional anesthesia right now. Some of the things that we would like to watch are reimbursement, how close is close enough with regards to the distance between the needle tip and the nerve, here, there, and everywhere in between, hopefully a new trick. Every uh, year I try and provide some new ultrasound images that might help you in your practice, and great experimentations for the knee. This will be a discussion on the current thinking of how to provide post-operative analgesia for major knee surgery. And of course, we will mention the uh, recent research done with Exparol, the liposome uh, bupivacaine formulation. First, what's around the river bend with healthcare reforms? Noridian Healthcare Solutions is a private uh, corporation that provides uh, administrative services to Medicare starting back in 1966 and they say here that their goal is to help your program dollar go further. A draft statement was released by Noridian LLC in April of 2013 wherein they stated providers should not expect separate payment for the establishment of epidural or other pain blocks unless the block is placed following discharge from PACU due to documented inadequate pain control. There was a revised statement issued after some comments that stated, however, if a need for transfer of pain management is documented and ordered by the surgeon and the accepting documents <clears throat> except for providing documents, the need for an acceptance of transfer of care, separate uh, reimbursement may be made for the service. However, they did backtrack again on the Part A Medicare hospital services, wherein again they stated that reimbursement for the control or management of pain in the immediate postoperative period is packaged into the payment for the procedure, surgical or anesthetic. In other words, pr providers should not expect separate payment for the establishment of epidural or other pain blocks unless the block is placed following discharge from the PACU. This uh, leads to some interesting future considerations. Number one, if blocks are reimbursed poorly or not at all, how will it change clinical practice? And number two, what can be done besides complaining to the CMS about this um, policy? Let's look first at, the, at this question. There was one study done published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine in 2012 uh, titled Primary Payer Status is Associated with the Use of Nerve Blocks Placement for Ambulatory Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, what the authors did was look at National Survey of Ambulatory Surgery data in 6,000 orthopedic uh, surgery anesthetics. The primary outcome that they looked at was payment method and the likelihood of a block. Some secondary measures were surgical procedure, patient demographics, and likelihood of a block. What they found is interesting. Obviously, there was a correlation between many of the more painful types of procedures and receiving a block. However, it is notable to see that down at the bottom, the method of payment, whether it was government versus self-pay or charity, had a very significant odds ratio in terms of whether or not the provider performed a block, as did the method of payment when private versus self-pay or charity was compared. So we know that whether or not uh, there is reimbursement for regional anesthesia procedure, there will be a heavy influence by whether the uh, anesthesiologist is compensated for that, and this is not a surprise. How might this affect patient care? What can we do besides complaining to CMS? Well, the first thing we need to do is recognize that we are in a precarious uh, position. Namely, there is more and more pressure for us to send patients home and not admit them to the hospital. We've got to remember that home is not equal to the PACU or an inpatient status. Specifically, at home, the patients will not have IV opioids. 
they will not have supplemental oxygen or monitoring, and they will not have parenteral antiemetics. So it is incumbent upon us to try and find out how we can provide safe and effective analgesia where what the patient is getting at home is comparable to what they might get in the hospital. In other words, it's not fair to give a patient a significant amount of IV analgesics that they cannot get at home, send them out home, and then several hours later have them be in excruciating pain. So in other words, what we're trying to do is find conditions that can duplicate the uh, analgesic options the patient has at home in the PACU. We must identify and document which patients will benefit postoperatively from a nerve block. Namely, are there certain types of procedures? Does personality trait have a factor in this? And how does the use of multimodal analgesia affect the need for postoperative or preoperative uh, pain block? This was a study that we performed at the University of Utah in uh, hip arthroscopy patients. This study looked at 107 patients having elective hip arthroscopy, which is a fairly painful procedure. The patients all received a distress risk assessment method questionnaire, and all the patients received preoperative oral uh, analgesics multimodal, namely pregabalin 150 milligrams, dependidol 100 milligrams, celecoxib 400 milligrams. The Distress Risk Assessment Method, or DRAM questionnaire, is a 45-item questionnaire that combines the Modified Zung Depression Scale and Modified Somatic Perception Questionnaire. This is a method uh, to validate or stratify low, moderate, or high-stress uh, psychological states. What we found in this study was when patients were consented for a fascia iliaca block uh, preoperatively, and they received all Ativa with remifentanil and propofol and intraoperative fentanyl at the discretion of the uh, attending anesthesiologist. When the patient arrived in the PACU, they were allowed to receive additional fentanyl not to exceed that which was associated with a respiratory rate less than 10. In other words, we tried to create an environment in the recovery room where they would not be getting such high levels of opioid to, number one, be dangerous or create false expectations at home. <clears throat> All of these patients had completed a DRAM questionnaire preoperatively. An important aspect of why we started with this uh, particular procedure was if you look at these two panels, they are the same patient. The only difference is an ultrasound of the inguinal region before and after a two and a half to three hour arthroscopy procedure in the hip, wherein significant amounts of uh, effluent from the uh, arthroscopy fluid seep into the tissues and alter the, an the anatomy. This is before arthroscopy, this is after, this is the femoral nerve, femoral artery, this is the femoral nerve, femoral artery. You'll notice that in both cases, both of these structures have been uh, displaced deeply um, from their original position prior to arthroscopy. And this makes the block technically more difficult to perform if we wait until after surgery rather than performing it before surgery. This, these arrows show the space deep to the fascia iliaca already containing a considerable amount of fluid. <clears throat> so who does require a block despite multimodal analgesia? In our study, 51% of patients did not require a block, but 49% did. The interesting thing was, of the patients who uh, required, uh, uh, of the patients who were studied for a DRAM score, the likelihood of the patient uh, receiving a block as their DRAM score increased went from 36 for patients with a low risk. 60% with moderate risk, and 70% of patients with a high DRAM score or high psychological stress required a block after surgery. In this patient population, there, the intraoperative uh, opioid administered was no different between blocks and no block patients. Likewise, the PACU opioid administered was not different between block and no block patients. 
The initial PACU-VAS score, however, was significantly higher in patients who requested a block compared to patients who did not. Fortunately, the change in VAS in response to the block was significantly, uh, was significantly better. In other words, the patient's pain scores responded more to a block than patients who received additional opioid without a block. And also, the discharge uh, VAS score was the same between patients who received no block and patients who received a block. There were no readmissions for pain control. So what we learned from this study was Despite aggressive multimodal analgesia, 49% of patients having hip arthroscopy places still required blocks. The DRAM score correlated significantly with the need for a block. Thankfully, patients with a high DRAM score had excellent response to the fascia iliaca block and were able to achieve a pain score equivalent to those of patients who did not receive a block. Both groups, block and no block, had discharge VAS scores of 2 to 3. There was no difference in the opioid requirements for block and no block patients. So we have valuable data that we can present to the patient and to third party carriers about hip arthroscopy requiring a high percentage of blocks despite doing everything we can in terms of multimodal analgesia. It would be very useful, since this is only the tip of the iceberg, to have comparable data for many other procedures such as rotator cuff repairs, ACL reconstructions, distal radius fractures, ankle fusions, bunions, and many other procedures. Shifting gears, we'd like to look at how close to the nerve is close enough, and you'll notice that we have a pendulum here. The pendulum has swung back and forth at least one time since the advent of ultrasound. Initially, after ultrasound, we were seeing uh, papers advocating intraneural injection, and as we have had the pendulum swing the other direction, there are those who would like to maximize the distance from the nerve when the block is performed. Some of the papers that encouraged very close proximity to the patients also reported a high incidence of nerve injury and reported the effects of such nerve injuries subsequently. The authors of these patients uh, suggested that nerve injury does not invariably result from intraneural injection. I'd like to look at this data a little more closely, however, because this paper published in uh, 2006 um, states that out of 72 axillary injections that were associated with intraneural deficits, there were or intraneural injections, there were no neural deficits. However, there is no data in this study about what the patient experienced between zero and six months. If you look at the fine print in the body of the article, it says, unfortunately, the author did not have access to diagnostic electrophysiologic tools such as sensory nerve conduction thresholds, nerve conduction uh, velocity. Further on, it states that it is possible the surgeon missed transient injuries early in the postoperative period, which may have resolved by the six-month follow-up. So in other words, the authors here did not look for and did not assess for the incidence of uh, injuries that persisted less than six months. And I would submit to you, especially for an upper extremity block, even uh, a persistent numbness or paresthesia that lasts two to three weeks, let alone six months, is a very significant problem for the patient. Another study that came out uh, in a like manner was as recently as 2012 where the authors stated that there was no evidence of nerve injury after intraneural injection during static popliteal block. Once again, a previous uh, article to this by the same authors stated that there were 83% of patients receiving intraneural injections unanticipated or unintentionally. The authors reported no deficits. However, if you read in the body of the article again, you will see that 50% of the patients were never examined postoperatively by the investigators. It's stated here in the body of the text, the patients were followed up at 24 and 48 hours after popliteal sciatic nerve block to assess completely, complete recovery of the sensory and motor blockade, either by examination or by phone call at home. The cover of anesthesiology went so far as to contain an injection needle that happens to be 
just in a perfect position in a needle without to, without hitting any nerve fascicles, but, but instead so that the local anesthetic spreads in connective tissue. Uh, this is a very, very um, uh, uh, rose-colored glass uh, appearance of this possibility, and it's more likely than not that we are unable to distinguish or, or um, resolve to such a fine degree when we're placing nerve blocks. Nonetheless, this was on the cover. We are hoping after these articles came out that with ultrasound, the only natural predator of the peripheral nerve would not be anesthesiologists. And thankfully, uh, recent uh, editorials and studies have supported the idea of staying as far away from the nerve as we can and still having success. As a matter of fact, uh, another recent study to counteract and swing the pendulum back the other way is one looking at the maximum effective distance for the needle to nerve when performing interscaling block. This was published in 2014. In this study, the authors uh, noted that at a distance of about four millimeters, there was a very, very high success rate. And what you see the dashed blue lines are the 95% confidence intervals. And they're simply showing that you can get a successful block even with an interscaling block without being in immediate proximity to the nerve. Here's an example of uh, the way we perform blocks, and you will see this is the middle scaling muscle, this is the brachial plexus, this is the anterior scaling, this is the uh, bevel, and you can see the bevel tip of the needle, uh, this being a sharp needle, that we are probably three quarters of a centimeter away from the brachial plexus at this point, and that's as close as we're going to get. So as we uh, go live with this, you'll see us deploying the catheter into this space, but maintaining a distance of about three quarters of a centimeter away from the brachial plexus, and these blocks work just fine. So we do know that this technique where we never puncture the connective tissue around the elements of the brachial plexus is very successful. We published a technique back in 2009 using this non-proximity uh, uh, technique where we stay outside the connective tissue surrounding the brachial plexus with very good results and very, very low complication rates. Remember that the distance between the nerve and fascial planes are two different birds. I say that because you can be very, very close to the nerve, but have a fascial plane between your needle tip and the nerve and not get a block. And by the same token, if there is not a fascial plane between your needle tip and the nerve, you can be substantially uh, further away from the nerve with the needle at the time injection occurs and still have success. If you look at the left panel, you can see a cadaver dissection, a fresh cadaver, where I'm holding up in my pickups the fascia iliaca overlying the femoral nerve. In the right panel, you can see uh, that the fascia iliaca has been incised, and it's easy to see here how the fascia iliaca is actually adherent to the femoral nerve. So you can imagine if you were advancing your needle from superficial to deep, you could be a millimeter away from the nerve and have a barrier to your local anesthetic and not get a block. By contrast, if you look at the distance between the uh, fascia iliaca, deep to the fascia iliaca, if you look at the distance between this uh, arrow on the left and the arrow on the right, if we are performing a block deep to the fascia iliaca, we can be fairly far away we can be fairly far away from the nerve and still have this block work. So this will work from far away. However, the needle tip positioned very close to the femoral nerve, but just superficial to that fascial plane will not be successful. So it's important to consider distance, but it's even more important to consider uh, the fascial planes between you and your target. Here, there, and everywhere in between, or what about an ankle block when you can't get to the ankle? What we'd like to talk to you about now are some alternative techniques to block the superficial peroneal nerve, the deep peroneal nerve, the sural nerve, and the tibial nerve. This is a fresh cadaver dissection of the left ankle. We're looking at the medial malleolus. This is the Achilles tendon. 
This is the medial malleolus. And what we've done here is we have dissected out the um, tibial nerve here, which is posterior to the tibial artery. And notice we've put our ruler deep to the retinaculum, the, the flexor retinaculum, and that retinaculum has had to be cut away to expose the tibial artery and tibial nerve. But this is a very, very good example of the, anatom the anatomic relationships of the flexor retinaculum and these um, nerves, the tibial nerve and the tibial artery. If we look a little closer, you'll be able to see that the tibial artery is a very reliable marker for the tibial nerve. Both of these structures are deep to the flexor retinaculum, which has been cut away in this view. Now, if we uh, follow the nerve more proximal, so we identify the tibial artery and the tibial nerve and the uh, flexor retinaculum. Here's the tibial nerve. Here's the tibial artery. And we have the uh, line here representing the flexor retinaculum, which is intact here. If we follow that proximally, these relationships between the tibial artery and tibial nerve remain constant. Or in other words, if you look at the left image on the screen where we are uh, imaging about halfway up the uh, tibia, you can see that the tibial artery is still anterior to the tibial nerve and both of these structures are still deep to the investing fascia of the leg. In this case, however, posterior to these uh, nerve and vessels is the flexor hallucis longus and anterior to these are the flexor, is the flexor digitorum longus. So the relationship deep to the investing fascia of the leg and the relationship of the artery being anterior to the nerve persists and we can use these landmarks to block the tibial nerve successfully a considerable distance up the leg if there's not a good spot to block at the ankle. If we look at the sural nerve, this is especially interesting. What we're imaging now is the lateral aspect of the right leg, and we have imaged the following structures. The um, Achilles tendon is on the left, or posterior. The peroneus longus and peroneus brevis are on the right, or anterior. And if we use a very light touch with the ultrasound transducer, we can see the small saphenous vein, which lies in immediate proximity to the sural nerve. So the sural nerve can actually be visualized pretty easily at the level of the ankle in its proximity to the small saphenous vein. Now, if we look further in a cadaver dissection, we see that surprisingly, the sural nerve travels from a position anterior to the Achilles tendon distally and ends up le uh, piercing the fascia of the leg between the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius. In this case, we see as where the transducer is at the mid-shaft of the tibia, and we can see the gastrocnemius muscle here. Notice that when we compare it to the uh, cadaver dissection on the lower right, we see that the sural nerve lies in the, in the uh, midsection of the gastrocnemius muscle before it pierces the investing fascia. So here's the lateral gastrocnemius, Here's the medial gastrocnemius, here's the small saphenous vein still with the sural nerve, and here is the sural nerve that can be blocked with two or three cc's of local anesthetic. So the trick is to find the uh, sural nerve distally at the level of the ankle and then using a very light touch, trace the uh, path of the small saphenous vein and uh, sural nerve together until they arrive at the midpoint between the medial lateral heads of the gastroc. What about the deep peroneal nerve? The deep peroneal nerve is deep to an extensor retinaculum which has been removed in this picture. And we removed the extensor retinaculum to be able to show you the relationship uh, between the um, tibial nerve or the uh, deep peroneal nerve and the tibial artery. Notice we have some tendons 
that we can use as surface la landmarks. On the medial side, we have the extensor hallucis longus. On the lateral side, we have the extensor digitorum longus. The anterior tibial artery is medial to the deep peroneal nerve. This is an ultrasound image with the transducer at the level of the ankle. And we see, once again, the relationship between the anterior tibial artery and the deep peroneal nerve. In this case, both structures are right on the surface of the distal tibia, on the surface of the periosteum. And once again, we see the extensor digitorum longus laterally and the extensor hallucis longus medially. It's very easy to find if we use a light touch and sometimes color flow to find the uh, anterior tibial artery and then look immediately adjacent to it to find the deep peroneal nerve. You can inject immediately uh, between or on the lateral side of the deep peroneal nerve about two or three cc's of local to get a, a successful block of the deep peroneal nerve. So once again, extensor hallucis longus, extensor digitorum longus, and distal tibia, anterior tibial artery, and deep peroneal nerve. If we move higher on the leg, there are some very useful landmarks to block the uh, deep peroneal nerve as well. These landmarks are the uh, fibula and the tibia. If we look on the um, medial side of this screen, we see the bony elements of the tibia, which uh, are connected to the fibula by an interosseous membrane, which has been marked here. The muscle that we see in this anterior compartment is the uh, tibialis anterior. It turns out that this interosseous membrane between the tibia and the fibula is very easy to see. And in fact, if you have the patient move their ankle up and down, you can actually see the interosseous membrane bow back and forth. And that lets you know that that, that is the correct structure. The a deep peroneal nerve still lies in close proximity to the anterior tibial artery. And a successful block can be, uh, be achieved by using the landmark of the anterior tibial artery to inject adjacent to, to uh, block the deep peroneal nerve, because the deep peroneal nerve is usually not visible at this level. The superficial peroneal nerve is one that is uniquely accessible with ultrasound. At the level of the ankle, you will not be able to see it. However, as we look at this fresh cadaver dissection, we see that the superficial peroneal nerve, as it approaches the ankle, fans out considerably. And that's why we used to use a field block from the lateral malleolus to the medial malleolus in the subcutaneous tissue to block it. However, if you want to go more proximal, you can block it at the mid-shaft of the fibula by using simply uh, 2 to 3 mLs. So as we move our transducer to the mid-shaft of the fibula, you can use the following landmarks to block the superficial peroneal nerve, and these are finding the uh, spine of the fibula, which is on the anterior surface. Off of the anterior spine of the fibula, we will see some dense connective tissue. This is the anterior intermuscular septum, which separates the anterior and the lateral compartments of the lower leg. If we follow the intermuscular septum out to the connecting fascia um, enveloping the uh, lower leg between the peroneus brevis and the extensor digitorum longus, we can follow the anterior mus intermuscular septum out to its uh, margin, and we will see a, a triangular structure there, which is the superficial peroneal nerve. And this has been marked by the three arrows. So it looks like a little triangular structure just on the posterior border of the anterior muscular septum and within the uh, investing fascia of the peroneus brevis. We're on the home stretch now. We'd like to talk about great expiraltations for the knee. So what is the big flap about expiral? The big flap is that orthopedic surgeons want pain relief. They know it's important for successful fast track recovery. However, peripheral nerve blocks, even though they're the most effective analgesic techniques, they're demanding in terms of expertise, and there is a risk of mus muscle paralysis, which can prevent ambulation in some cases. So this is a very important issue for surgeons, muscle paralysis especially. If we look at knee arthroscopy patients, there are a number of uh, 
studies going on comparing multimodal plus femoral catheter to other techniques such as multimodal plus adductor canal block and now multimodal plus intraarticular Expiril. What is Expiril? Expiril is liposomal bupivacaine. It's FDA approved for single injection wound infiltration. It is currently not approved for peripheral nerve blocks. It ideally produces analgesia for up to 72 hours and because it's a uh, high concentration of 1.3 percent or 13 milligrams per ml and its wholesale cost is $285 for a vial. Now I tell you this because it's going to be important from a cost consideration to see whether this, and remember this is the wholesale cost, is cheaper to do compared to a, a peripheral nerve catheter. The real advantage though that the, uh, the authors are hoping for with Expril is that by doing intraarticular injections they will be able to achieve excellent analgesia without having any nerve block or sensory compromise on the uh, surface of the leg or knee. One of the earliest studies performed documenting the duration and effectiveness of Expril was performed in hemorrhoidectomy patients where wound infiltration was used. In this, the authors reported that there was a reduction in pain and opioid use through 72 hours relative to placebo. And this was a 45% reduction in opioid uh, consumption and a 30% reduction in cumulative pain scores. This same study was performed uh, something very similar with intraarticular injections in the knee. Both of these have been published within the last couple of years. It's interesting though if we get back to the um, hemorrhoidectomy study. This uh, study is, is, is uh, this table is presented uh, a, in an interesting fashion in that they are looking at uh, opioid requirements in 12-hour increments. You'll notice that in the first 12-hour uh, uh, interval, the requirements for rescue opioid between the uh, Expril or Depofoam bupivacaine group and placebo was 8.5 in morphine equivalents. Now the authors stated that there was a significant difference in opioid requirements at each subsequent interval in the study. However, if you account for the initial discrepancy of 8.5 milligrams and then subsequently just look at the 12-hour interval difference at subsequent 12-hour intervals, you will see that there was a 5.1 versus 4.3 in the 24-hour interval, there was 4.4 versus 3.3 in the 36-hour, 1.5 versus 2.1, and so on. And at the end of the day, in reality, the only interval where patients required less opioid in the study group or the depot foam bupivacaine was the first 12-hour interval. In fact, there was a trend, if you look, uh, this was not statistically significant, but in four of the subsequent intervals, patients actually required more opioid rescue medication in the depofoam bupivacaine group than they did in the placebo group. So it's very important when looking at this data that we look very carefully at it. Uh, likewise, when we look at the knee arthroscopy patient, the patients who, re who uh, received intraarticular um, bupivacaine uh, versus depot foam bupivacaine. So in this study there were five groups. There were four groups receiving intraarticular depot foam bupivacaine and one group receiving plain bupivacaine. And the analgesia scores in these patients were only significantly different on day one. On days two, three, four there was no difference and again uh, on day five there was a significant difference between the uh, plain bupivacaine and depot foam bupivacaine. So this was interesting. I'm not sure how to explain this difference uh, five days out. But needless to say, the, uh, there is still a lot of information we need on Expril before we can make a definitive uh, statement about this. It's also interesting to note that peak plasma concentrations in this study of the knee uh, were not apparent until almost 36 hours after the administration of the drug, and that was in the patient's who received 532 milligrams. So this is something to consider in patients that you're sending home. You're, even though the level here was not, was not uh, concerning, 
the actual peak level does not occur for some time after administration. Knee replacements. Can they t walk with a block? For knee arthroscopy, uh, when you look at multimodal plus ephemeral catheter, multimodal plus adductor canal, and multimodal versus intraarticular uh, expiral, all of these studies are focused on preserving motor function and also providing excellent pain relief. You remember that back in 2009, we did some dissections and suggested, uh, based on clinical data, that using uh, an, a uh, adductor canal block can be possible as an alternative to the inguinal approach to the femoral artery or femoral uh, nerve uh, to allow a motor sparing block for knee arthroplasty and anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. And this is just a, uh, a representation of how this block is performed with the landmarks being sartorius, vastus medialis. And we're actually a little bit distal to the true adductor canal here because we don't see the femoral artery and we don't see the adductor muscles, but we are just distal uh, to the uh, posterior uh, dive of the femoral artery into the popteal fossa here in this image. There has and continues to be very much interest in the adductor canal block for total knee replacement and other major knee surgeries. As you can see, just in 2013, 2014, there have been a number of uh, very major articles. So there's a lot of interest in this. We would like to point out to you one other study that we published in cl Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research uh, titled uh, continuous femoral nerve block using 0.125% pupivacaine does not prevent early ambulation after total knee arthroplasty. In this study, we looked at 77 patients who received 0.125% bupivacaine at 5 ml per hour, and we noted that 45% of these patients walked on the day of surgery, 100% of them walked on post-op day one, and 62% climbed stairs on post-op day one. So uh, what this was uh, important for, in addition to the fact that there were no patient falls, is that you can use a femoral nerve catheter and still have successful ambulation and rehab. An interesting side note on this study was that there was a trend that suggested that in some of our patients who did not ambulate, it was not necessarily due to the block, but because they came out of the operating room later in the day with a spinal and the physical therapist did not have time to ambulate them. In other words, there was a trend showing that uh, spinal anesthesia, as opposed to TIVA, which we use on all of our patients, actually may have slowed the time to ambulation in this setting. Thank you.